Chapter 04, wherein the Sintons are disappointed, and Mrs. Comstock learns that she can laugh. With the first streak of red above the Limbalos, Margaret Sinton was busy with the gingham and the intricate paper pattern she had purchased. Wesley cooked the breakfast and worked until he thought Elnora would be gone, then he started to bring her mother. Now you be mighty careful, cautioned Margaret. I don't know how she will take it. I don't either, said Wesley philosophically, but she's got to take it some way. That dress has to be finished by school time in the morning. Wesley had not slept well that night. He had been so busy framing diplomatic speeches to make to Mrs. Comstock that sleep had little chance with him. Every step nearer to her he approached his position seemed less enviable. By the time he reached the front gate and started down the walk between the rows of asters and lady slippers he was perspiring, and every plausible and convincing speech had fled his brain. Mrs. Comstock helped him. She met him at the door. Good morning she said. Did Margaret send you for something? Yes, said Wesley. She's got a job that's too big for her, and she wants you to help. Of course I will, said Mrs. Comstock. It was no one's affair how lonely the previous day had been, or how the endless hours of the present would drag. What is she doing in such a rush? Now was his chance. She's making a dress for Elnora, answered Wesley. He saw Mrs. Comstock's form straighten, and her face harden, so he continued hastily. You see Elnora has been helping us at harvest time, butchering, and with unexpected visitors for years. We've made out that she's saved us a considerable sum, and as she wouldn't ever touch any pay for anything, we just went to town and got a few clothes we thought would fix her up a little for the high school. We want to get a dress done today mighty bad, but Margaret is slow about sewing, and she never can finish alone, so I came after you. And it's such a simple little matter, so dead easy, and also between old friends like, that you can't look above your boots while you explain it, sneered Mrs. Comstock. Wesley Sinton, what put the idea into your head that Elnora would take things bought with money, when she wouldn't take the money? Then Sinton's eyes came up straightly finding her on the trail last night sobbing as hard as I ever saw anyone at a funeral. She wasn't complaining at all, but she's come to me all her life with her little hurts, and she couldn't hide how she'd been laughed at, twitted, and run face to face against the fact that there were books and tuition, unexpected, and nothing will ever make me believe you didn't know that, Kate Comstock. If any doubts are troubling you on that subject, sure I knew it. She was so anxious to try the world, I thought I'd just let her take a few knocks and see how she liked them. As if she'd ever taken anything but knocks all her life, cried Wesley Sinton. Kate Comstock, you are a heartless, selfish woman. You've never shown Elnora any real love in her life. If ever she finds out that thing you'll lose her, and it will serve you right. She knows it now, said Mrs. Comstock icily, and she'll be home tonight just as usual. Well, you are a brave woman if you dared put a girl of Elnora's make through what she suffered yesterday, and will suffer again today, and let her know you did it on purpose. I admire your nerve, but I've watched this since Elnora was born, and I got enough. Things have come to a pass where they go better for her, or I interfere. As if you'd ever done anything but interfere all her life. Think I haven't watched you. Think I, with my heart raw in my breast, and too numb to resent it openly, haven't seen you and Mag Sinton trying to turn Elnora against me day after day. When did you ever tell her what her father meant to me? When did you ever try to make her see the wreck of my life, and what I've suffered? No indeed, always it's been poor little abused Elnora, and cakes, kissing, extra clothes, and encouraging her to run to you with a pitiful mouth every time I try to make a woman of her. Kate Comstock, that's unjust, cried Sinton. Only last night I tried to show her the picture I saw the day she was born. I begged her to come to you and tell you pleasant what she needed, and ask you for what I happen to know you can well afford to give her. I can't, cried Mrs. Comstock. You know I can't. Then get so you can, said Wesley Sinton. Any day you say the word you can sell six thousand worth of rare timber off this place easy. 
I'll see to clearing and working the fields cheap as dirt, for Elnora's sake. I'll buy you more cattle to fatten. All you've got to do is sign a lease, to pull thousands from the ground in oil, as the rest of us are doing all around you. Cut down Robert's trees, shrieked Mrs. Comstock, tear up his land, cover everything with horrid, greasy oil. I'll die first. You mean you'll let Elnora go like a beggar, and hurt and mortify her past bearing? I've got to the place where I tell you plain what I am going to do. Maggie and I went to town last night, and we bought what things Elnora needs most urgent to make her look a little like the rest of the high school girls. Now here it is in plain English, you can help get these things ready, and let us give them to her as we want. She won't touch them, cried Mrs. Comstock. Then you can pay us, and she can take them as her right. I won't, then I will tell Elnora just what you are worth, what you can afford, and how much of this she owns. I'll loan her the money to buy books and decent clothes, and when she is of age she can sell her share and pay me. Mrs. Comstock gripped a chair back and opened her lips, but no words came. And, Sinton continued, if she is so much like you that she won't do that, I'll go to the county seat and lay complaint against you as her guardian before the judge. I'll swear to what you are worth, and how you are raising her, and have you discharged, or have the judge appoint some man who will see that she is comfortable, educated, and decent looking. You, you wouldn't, gasped Kate Comstock. I won't need to, Kate, said Sinton, his heart softening the instant the hard words were said. You won't show it, but you do love Elnora. You can't help it, you must see how she needs things, come help us fix them, and be friends. Maggie and I couldn't live without her, and you couldn't either. You've got to love such a fine girl as she is, let it show a little. You can hardly expect me to love her, said Mrs. Comstock coldly. But for her a man would stand back of me now, who would beat the breath out of your sneaking body for the cowardly thing with which you threatened me. After all I've suffered you'd drag me to court and compel me to tear up Robert's property. If I ever go they carry me, if they touch one tree, or put down one greasy old oil well, it will be over all I can shoot, before they begin. Now, see how quick you can clear out of here. You won't come and help Maggie with the dress. For answer Mrs. Comstock looked around swiftly for some object on which to lay her hands. Knowing her temper, Wesley Sinton left with all the haste consistent with dignity. But he did not go home. He crossed a field, and in an hour brought another neighbor who was skillful with her needle. With sinking heart Margaret saw them coming. Kate is too busy to help today, she can't sew before tomorrow, said Wesley cheerfully as they entered. That quieted Margaret's apprehension a little, though she had some doubts. Wesley prepared the lunch, and by four o'clock the dress was finished as far as it possibly could be until it was fitted on Elnora. If that did not entail too much work, it could be completed in two hours. Then Margaret packed their purchases into the big market basket. Wesley took the hat, umbrella, and raincoat, and they went to Mrs. Comstock's. As they reached the step, Margaret spoke pleasantly to Mrs. Comstock, who sat reading just inside the door, but she did not answer and deliberately turned a leaf without looking up. Wesley Sinton opened the door and went in followed by Margaret, Kate, he said, you needn't take out your mad over our little racket on Maggie. I ain't told her a word I said to you, or you said to me. She's not so very strong, and she's sewed since four o'clock this morning to get this dress ready for tomorrow. It's done and we came down to try it on Elnora. Is that the truth, Mag Sinton? demanded Mrs. Comstock. You heard Wesley say so, proudly affirmed Mrs. Sinton. I want to make you a proposition, said Wesley. Wait till Elnora comes, then we'll show her the things and see what she says. How would it do to see what she says without bribing her, sneered Mrs. Comstock. If she can stand what she did yesterday, and will today, she can bear, most anything, said Wesley. Put away the clothes if you want to, till we tell her. Well, you don't take this waste I'm working on, said Margaret, 
for I have to baste in the sleeves and set the collar. Put the rest out of sight if you like. Mrs. Comstock picked up the basket and bundles, placed them inside her room and closed the door. Margaret threaded her needle and began to sew. Mrs. Comstock returned to her book, while Wesley fidgeted and raged inwardly. He could see that Margaret was nervous and almost in tears, but the lines in Mrs. Comstock's impassive face were set and cold. So they sat while the clock ticked off the time, one hour, two, dusk, and no Elnora. Just when Margaret and Wesley were discussing whether he had not better go to town to meet Elnora, they heard her coming up the walk. Wesley dropped his tilted chair and squared himself. Margaret gripped her sewing and turned pleading eyes toward the door. Mrs. Comstock closed her book and grimly smiled. Mother, please open the door, called Elnora. Mrs. Comstock arose and swung back the screen. Elnora stepped in beside her, bent half double, the whole front of her dress gathered into a sort of bag filled with a heavy load and one arm stacked high with books. In the dim light she did not see the symptoms. Please hand me the empty bucket in the kitchen, mother, she said. I just had to bring these arrow points home, but I'm scared for fear I've spoiled my dress and will have to wash it. I'm to clean them and take them to the banker in the morning, and oh, mother, I've sold enough stuff to pay for my books, my tuition, and maybe a dress and some lighter shoes besides. Oh, mother I'm so happy. Take the books and bring the bucket. Then she saw Margaret and Wesley. Oh, glory, she exulted. I was just wondering how I'd ever wait to tell you, and here. You are. It's too perfectly splendid to be true. Tell us, Elnora, said Sinton. Well, sir, said Elnora, doubling down on the floor and spreading out her skirt, set the bucket here, mother. These points are brittle, and should be put in one at a time. If they are chipped I can't sell them. Well sir, I've had a time. You know I just had to have books. I tried three stores, and they wouldn't trust me, not even three days, I didn't know what in this world I could do quickly enough. Just when I was almost frantic I saw a sign in a bank window asking for caterpillars, cocoons, butterflies, arrow points, and everything. I went in, and it was this bird woman who wants the insects, and the banker wants the stones. I had to go to school then, but, if you'll believe it, Elnora beamed on all of them in turn as she talked and slipped the arrow points from her dress to the pail, if you'll believe it, but you won't, hardly, until you look at the books, there was the mathematics teacher, waiting at his door, and he had a set of books for me that he had telly. Phoned a sophomore to bring. How did he happen to do that? Elnora, interrupted Sinton. Elnora blushed. It was a full mistake I made yesterday in thinking books were just handed out to one. There was a teacher's meeting last night and the history teacher told about that. Professor Henley thought of me. You know I told you what he said about my algebra, mother. Ain't I glad I studied out some of it myself this summer. So he telephoned and a girl brought the books. Because they are marked and abused some I get the whole outfit for two dollars. I can erase most of the marks, paste down the covers, and fix them so they look better. But I must hurry to the joy part. I didn't stop to eat. At noon, I just ran to the bird woman's, and I had lunch with her. It was salad, hot chocolate, and lovely things, and she wants to buy most every old scrap I ever gathered. She wants dragonflies, moths, butterflies, and he, the banker, I mean, wants everything Indian. This very night she came to the swamp with me and took away enough stuff to pay for the books and tuition, and tomorrow she is going to buy some more. Elnora laid the last arrow point in the pail and arose, shaking leaves and bits of baked earth from her dress. She reached into her pocket, produced her money and waved it before their wondering eyes. And that's the joy part. She exulted, put it up in the clock till morning, mother, that pays for the books and tuition and, Elnora hesitated, for she saw the nervous grasp with which her mother's fingers closed on the bills. Then she continued, but more slowly and thinking before she spoke. What I get tomorrow pays for more books and tuition, and maybe a few, just a few, things to wear. 
These shoes are so dreadfully heavy and hot, and they make such a noise on the floor. There isn't another calico dress in the whole building, not among hundreds of us. Why, what is that? Aunt Margaret, what are you hiding in your lap? She snatched the waist and shook it out, and her face was beaming. Have you taken to waists all fancy and buttoned in? The back, I bet you this is mine. I bet you so too, said Margaret Sinton. You undress right away and try it on, and if it fits, it will be done for morning. There are some low shoes, too. Elnora began to dance. Oh, you dear people, she cried. I can pay for them tomorrow night. Isn't it too splendid? I was just thinking on the way home that I certainly would be compelled to have cooler shoes until later, and I was wondering what I'd do when the fall rains begin. I meant to get you some heavy dress skirts and a coat then, said Mrs. Comstock. I know you said so, cried Elnora, but you needn't, now. I can buy every single stitch I need myself. Next summer I can gather up a lot more stuff, and all winter on the way to school. I am sure I can sell ferns, I know I can nuts, and the bird woman says the grade rooms want leaves, grasses, birds' nests, and cocoons. Oh, isn't this world lovely? I'll be helping with the tax, next, mother. Elnora waved the waist and started for the bedroom. When she opened the door she gave a little cry. What have you people been doing? She demanded. I never saw so many interesting bundles in all my life. I'm scared to death for fear I can't pay for them and will have to give up something. Wouldn't you take them if you could not pay for them, Elnora? Asked her mother instantly. Why, not unless you did, answered Elnora. People have no right to wear things they can't afford, have they? But from such old friends as Maggie and Wesley, Mrs. Comstock's voice was oily with triumph. From them least of all, cried Elnora stoutly, from a stranger sooner than from them, to whom I owe so much more than I ever can pay now. Well, you don't have to, said Mrs. Comstock. Maggie just selected these things, because she is more in touch with the world, and has got such good taste. You can pay as long as your money holds out, and if there's more necessary, maybe I can sell the butcher a calf, or if things are too costly for us, of course, they can take them back put on the waist now, and then you can look over the rest and see if they are suitable, and what you want. Elnora stepped into the adjoining room and closed the door. Mrs. Comstock picked up the bucket and started for the well with it. At the bedroom she paused. Elnora, were you going to wash these arrow points? Yes, the bird woman says they sell better if they are clean, so it can be seen that there are no defects in them. Of course, said Mrs. Comstock. Some of them seem quite baked. Shall I put them to soak? Do you want to take them in the morning? Yes, I do, answered Elnora. If you would just fill the pail with water. Mrs. Comstock left the room. Wesley Sinton sat with his back to the window in the west end of the cabin which overlooked the well. A suppressed sound behind him caused him to turn quickly. Then he arose and leaned over Margaret. She's out there laughing like a blamed monkey, he whispered indignantly. Well, she can't help it, exclaimed Margaret. I'm going home, said Wesley. Oh no, you are not, retorted Margaret. You are missing the point. The point is not how you look or feel. It is to get these things in Elnora's possession past dispute. You go now, and tomorrow Elnora will wear calico, and Kate Comstock will return these goods. Right here I stay until everything we bought is Elnora's. What are you going to do? Asked Wesley. I don't know yet, myself, said Margaret. Then she arose and peered from the window. At the well curb stood Catherine Comstock. The strain of the day was finding reaction. Her chin was in the air, she was heaving, shaking and strangling to suppress any sound. The word that slipped between Margaret Sinton's lips shocked Wesley until he dropped on his chair and recalled her to her senses. She was fairly composed as she turned to Elnora, and began the fitting. When she had pinched, pulled, and patted she called, come see if you think this fits, Kate. Mrs. Comstock had gone around to the back door and answered from the kitchen. 
You know more about it than I do. Go ahead. I'm getting supper. Don't forget to allow for what it will shrink in washing. I set the colors and washed the goods last night. It can be made to fit right now, answered Margaret. When she could find nothing more to alter she told Elnora to heat some water. After she had done that the girl began opening packages. The hat came first. Mother, cried Elnora. Mother, of course, you have seen this, but you haven't seen it on me. I must try it on. Don't you dare put that on your head until your hair is washed and properly combed, said Margaret. Oh, cried Elnora, is that water to wash my hair? I thought it was to set the color in another dress. Well, you thought wrong, said Margaret simply. Your hair is going to be washed and brushed until it shines like copper. While it dries you can eat your supper, and this dress will be finished. Then you can put on your new ribbon, and your hat. You can try your shoes now, and if they don't fit, you and Wesley can drive to town and change them. That little round bundle on the top of the basket is your stockings. Margaret sat down and began sewing swiftly, and a little later opened the machine, and ran several long seams. Elnora returned in a few minutes holding up her skirts and stepping daintily in the new shoes. Don't soil them, honey, else you're sure they fit, cautioned Wesley. They seem just a trifle large, maybe, said Elnora dubiously, and Wesley knelt to feel. He and Margaret thought him a fit, and then Elnora appealed to her mother. Mrs. Comstock appeared wiping her hands on her apron. She examined the shoes critically. They seemed to fit, she said, but they are way too fine to walk country roads. I think so, too, said Elnora instantly. We had better take these back and get a cheaper pair. Oh, let them go for this time, said Mrs. Comstock. They are so pretty, I hate to part with them. You can get cheaper ones after this. Wesley and Margaret scarcely breathed for a long time. When Wesley went to do the feeding, Elnora set the table. When the water was hot, Margaret pinned a big towel around Elnora's shoulders and washed and dried the lovely hair according to the instructions she had been given the previous night. As the hair began to dry it billowed out in a sparkling sheen that caught the light and gleamed and flashed. Now, the idea is to let it stand naturally, just as the curl will make it. Don't you do any of that nasty, untidy snarling, Elnora, cautioned Margaret. Wash it this way every two weeks while you are in school, shake it out, and dry it. Then part it in the middle and turn a front quarter on each side from your face. You tie the back at your neck with a string, so, and the ribbon goes in a big, loose bow. I'll show you. One after another Margaret Sinton tied the ribbons, creasing each of them so they could not be returned, as she explained that she was trying to find the color most becoming. Then she produced the raincoat which carried Elnora into transports. Mrs. Comstock objected, that won't be warm enough for cold weather, and you can't afford it and a coat, too. I'll tell you what I thought, said Elnora. I was planning on the way home. These coats are fine because they keep you dry. I thought I would get one, and a warm sweater to wear under it cold days. Then I always would be dry, and warm. The sweater only costs three dollars, so I could get it and the raincoat both. For half the price of a heavy cloth coat. You are right about that, said Mrs. Comstock. You can change more with the weather, too. Keep the raincoat, Elnora. Wear it until you try the hat, said Margaret. It will have to do until the dress is finished. Elnora picked up the hat dubiously. Mother, may I wear my hair as it is now? She asked. Let me take a good look, said Catherine Comstock. Heaven only knows what she saw. To Wesley and to Margaret the bright young face of Elnora, with its pink tints, its heavy dark brows, its bright blue-gray eyes, and its frame of curling reddish-brown hair was the sweetest sight on earth, and at that instant Elnora was radiant. So long as it's your own hair, and combed back as plain as it will go, I don't suppose it cuts much ice whether it's tied a little tighter or looser, conceded Mrs. Comstock. If you stop right there, you may let it go at that. Elnora set the hat on her head. 
It was only a wide tan straw with three exquisite peacock quills at one side. Margaret Sinton cried out. Wesley slapped his knee and sighed deeply while Mrs. Comstock stood speechless for a second. I wish you had asked the price before you put that on, she said impatiently. We never can afford it. It's not so much as you think, said Margaret. Don't you see what I did? I had him take off the quills and put on some of those Phoebe Sims gave me from her peacocks. The hat will only cost you a dollar and a half. She avoided Wesley's eyes and looked straight at Mrs. Comstock. Elnora removed the hat to examine it. Why, they are those reddish tan quills of yours. She cried, Mother, look how beautifully they are set on. I'd much rather have them than those from the store. So would I, said Mrs. Comstock. If Margaret wants to spare them, that will make you a beautiful hat, dirt cheap, too. You must go past Mrs. Sims and show her. She would be pleased to see them. Elnora sank into a chair and contemplated her toe. Landy, ain't I a queen? She murmured, what else have I got? Just a belt, some handkerchiefs, and a pair of top shoes for rainy days and colder weather, said Margaret. About those high shoes, that was my idea, said Wesley. Soon as it rains, low shoes won't do, and by taking two pairs at once I could get them some cheaper. The low ones are two and the high ones two fifty, together three seventy five. Ain't that cheap? That's a real bargain, said Mrs. Comstock, if they are good shoes, and they look it. This, said Wesley, producing the last package, is your Christmas present from your Aunt Maggie. I got mine, too, but it's at the house. I'll bring it up in the morning. He handed Margaret the umbrella, and she passed it over to Elnora who opened it and sat laughing under its shelter. Then she kissed both of them. She brought a pencil and a slip of paper to set down the prices they gave her of everything they had brought except the umbrella, added the sum, and said laughingly, will you please wait till tomorrow for the money? I will have it then, sure. Elnora, said Wesley Sinton, wouldn't you, Elnora, hustle here a minute, called Mrs. Comstock from the kitchen. I need you. One second, mother, answered Elnora, throwing off the coat and hat, and closing the umbrella as she ran. There were several errands to do in a hurry, and then supper. Elnora chatted incessantly, Wesley and Margaret talked all they could, while Mrs. Comstock said a word now and then, which was all she ever did. But Wesley Sinton was watching her, and time and again he saw a peculiar little twist around her mouth. He knew that for the first time in sixteen years she really was laughing over something. She had all she could do to preserve her usually sober face. Wesley knew what she was thinking. After supper the dress was finished, the pattern for the next one discussed, and then the Sintons went home. Elnora gathered her treasures. When she started upstairs she stopped. May I kiss you good night, mother? She asked lightly. Never mind any slobbering said Mrs. Comstock. I should think you'd lived with me long enough to know that I don't care for it. Well, I'd love to show you in some way how happy I am, and how I thank you. I wonder what for, said Mrs. Comstock. Max Sinton chose that stuff and brought it here and you pay for it. Yes, but you seemed willing for me to have it, and you said you would help me if I couldn't pay all. Maybe I did, said Mrs. Comstock. Maybe I did. I meant to get you some heavy dress skirts about Thanksgiving, and I still can get them. Go to bed, and for any sake don't begin mooning. Before a mirror, and make a dunce of yourself. Mrs. Comstock picked up several papers and blew out the kitchen light. She stood in the middle of the sitting room floor for a time and then went into her room and closed the door. Sitting on the edge of the bed she thought for a few minutes and then suddenly buried her face in the pillow and again heaved with laughter. Down the road plodded Margaret and Wesley Sinton. Neither of them had words to utter the united thought. Done, hissed Wesley at last. Done, Brown. Did you ever feel like a bloomin', confounded donkey? How did the woman do it? She didn't do it, gulped Margaret through her tears. She didn't do anything. She trusted to Elnora's great big soul to bring her out right, and really she was right, 
and so it had to bring her. She's a darling, Wesley, but she's got a time before her. Did you see Kate Comstock grab that money? Before six months she'll be out combing the Limberlost for bugs and R. Rao points to help pay the tax. I know her. Well, I don't, exclaimed Sinton. She's too many for me. But there is a laugh left in her yet. I didn't suppose there was. Bet you a dollar, if we could see her this minute, she'd be chuckling over the way we got left. Both of them stopped in the road and looked back. There's Elnora's light in her room, said Margaret. The poor child will feel those clothes, and pour over her books till morning, but she'll look decent to go to school, anyway. Nof. Ing is too big a price to pay for that. Yes, if Kate lets her wear them, ten to one, she makes her finish the week with that old stuff. No, she won't, said Margaret. She'll hardly dare. Kate made some concessions, all right. Big ones for her, if she did get her way in the main. She bent some, and if Elnor approves that she can walk out barehanded in the morning and come back with that much money in her pocket, an armful of books, and buy a turnout like that, she proves that she is of some consideration, and Kate's smart enough. She'll think twice before she'll do that. Elnora won't wear a calico dress to high school again. You watch and see if she does. She may have the best clothes she'll get for a time, for the least money, but she won't know it until she tries to buy goods herself at the same rates. Wesley, what about those prices? Didn't they shrink considerable? You began it, said Wesley. Those prices were all right. We didn't say what the goods cost us, we said what they would cost her. Surely, she's mistaken about being able to pay all that. Can she pick up stuff of that value around the Limberlost? Didn't the bird woman see her trouble, and just give her the money? I don't think so, said Margaret. Seems to me I've heard of her paying, or offering to pay those who would take the money, for bugs and butterflies, and I've known people who sold that banker Indian stuff. Once I heard that his pipe collection beat that of the government at the Philadelphia Centennial. Those things have come to have a value. Well, there's about a bushel of that kind of valuables piled up in the woodshed that belongs to Elnora. At least, I picked them up because she said she wanted them. Ain't it queer that she'd take to stones, bugs, and butterflies, and save them? Now they are going to bring her the very thing she wants the worst. Lord, but this is a funny world when you get to studying. Looks like things didn't all come by accident. Looks as if there was a plan back of it, and somebody driving that knows the road, and how to handle the lines. Anyhow, Elnora's in the wagon, and when I get out in the night and the dark closes around me, and I see the stars, I don't feel so cheap. Maggie, how the nation did Kate Comstock do that? You will keep on harping, Wesley. I told you she didn't do it. Elnora did it. She walked in and took things right out of our hands. All Kate had to do was to enjoy having it go her way, and she was cute enough to put in a few questions that sort of guided Elnora. But I don't know, Wesley. This thing makes me think, too. Suppose we'd taken Elnora when she was a baby, and we'd heaped on her all the love we can't on our own, and we'd coddled, petted, and shielded her, would she have made the woman that living alone, learning to think for herself, and taking all the knocks Kate Comstock could give, have made of her. You bet your life, cried Wesley, warmly, loving anybody don't hurt them. We wouldn't have done anything but love her. You can't hurt a child loving it. She'd have learned to work, to study, and grown into a woman with us, without suffering like a poor homeless dog. But you don't see the point, Wesley. She would have grown into a fine woman with us. But as we would have raised her, would her heart ever have known the world as it does now? Where's the anguish, Wesley, that child can't comprehend? Seeing what she's seen of her mother hasn't hardened her. She can understand any mother's sorrow. Living life from the rough side has only broadened her. Where's the girl or boy burning with shame, or struggling to find a way, that will cross Elnora's path and not get a lift from her? She's had the knocks, but there'll never be any of the thing you call, false pride, in her. I guess we better keep out. Maybe Kate Comstock knows what she's doing.
sure as you live, Elnora has grown bigger on Knox than she would on love. I don't suppose there ever was a very fine point to anything but I missed it, said Wesley, because I am blunt, rough, and have no book learning to speak of. Since you put it into words I see what you mean, but it's dinged hard on Elnora, just the same. And I don't keep out. I keep watching closer than ever. I got my slap in the face, but if I don't miss my guess, Kate Comstock learned her lesson, same as I did. She learned that I was in earnest, that I would haul her to court if she didn't loosen up a bit, and she'll loosen. You see, if she doesn't, it may come hard, and the hinges creak, but she'll fix Elnora decent after this, if Elnora doesn't prove that she can fix herself. As for me, I found out that what I was doing was as much for myself as for Elnora. I wanted her to take those things from us, and love us for giving them. It didn't work, and but for you, I'd mess the whole thing and stuck like a pig in crossing a bridge. But you helped me out, Elnora's got the clothes, and by morning, maybe I won't grudge Kate the only laugh she's had in sixteen years. You've been showing me the way quite a spell now, ain't you, Maggie? In her attic Elnora lighted two candles, set them on her little table, stacked the books, and put away the precious clothes. How lovingly she hung the hat and umbrella, folded the raincoat, and spread the new dress over a chair. She fingered the ribbons, and tried to smooth the creases from them. She put away the hose neatly folded, touched the handkerchiefs, and tried the belt. Then she slipped into her white nightdress, shook down her hair that it might become thoroughly dry, set a chair before the table, and reverently opened one of the books. A stiff draft swept the attic, for it stretched the length of the cabin, and had a window in each end. Elnora arose and going to the east window closed it. She stood for a minute looking at the stars, the sky, and the dark outline of the straggling trees of the rapidly dismantling Limberlost. In the region of her case a tiny point of light flashed and disappeared. Elnora straightened and wondered, was it wise to leave her precious money there? The light flashed once more, wavered a few seconds, and died out. The girl waited. She did not see it again, so she turned to her books. In the limber lost the hulking figure of a man sneaked down the trail. The bird woman was at Freckles's room this evening, he muttered. Wonder what for. He left the trail, entered the enclosure still distinctly outlined, and approached the case. The first point of light flashed from the tiny electric lamp on his vest. He took a duplicate key from his pocket, felt for the padlock and opened it. The door swung wide. The light flashed the second time. Swiftly his glance swept the interior. About a fourth of her moths gone. Elnora must have been with the bird woman and given them to her. Then he stood tense. His keen eyes discovered the roll of bills hastily thrust back in the bottom of the case. He snatched them up, shut off the light, relocked the case by touch, and swiftly went down the trail. Every few seconds he paused and listened intently. Just as he reached the road, a second figure approached him. Is it you, Pete? came the whispered question. Yes, said the first man. I was coming down to take a peep, when I saw your flash, he said. I heard the bird woman had been at the case today. Anything doing? Not a thing, said Pete. She just took away about a fourth of the moths. Probably had the Comstock girl getting them for her. Heard they were together. Likely she'll get the rest tomorrow. Ain't picking getting bear these days. Well, I should say so, said the second man, turning back in disgust. Coming home, now. No, I am going down this way, answered Pete, for his eyes caught the gleam from the window of the Comstock cabin, and he had a desire to learn why Elnora's attic was lighted at that hour. He slouched down the road, occasionally feeling the size of the roll he had not taken time to count. The attic was too long, the light too near the other end, and the cabin stood much too far back from the road. He could see nothing although he climbed the fence and walked back opposite the window. He knew Mrs. Comstock was probably awake, and that she sometimes went to the swamp behind her home at night. At times a cry went up from that locality that paralyzed anyone near, 
or sent them fleeing as if for life. He did not care to cross behind the cabin. He returned to the road, passed, and again climbed the fence. Opposite the west window he could see Elnora. She sat before a small table reading from a book between two candles. Her hair fell in a bright sheen around her, and with one hand she lightly shook and tossed it as she studied. The man stood out in the night and watched. For a long time a leaf turned at intervals and the hair drying went on. The man drew nearer. The picture grew more beautiful as he approached. He could not see so well as he desired, for the screen was of white mosquito netting, and it angered him. He cautiously crept closer. The elevation shut off his view. Then he remembered the large willow tree shading the well and branching across the window fit the west end of the cabin. From childhood Elnora had stepped from the sill to a limb and slid down the slanting trunk of the tree. He reached it and noiselessly swung himself up. Three steps out on the big limb the man shuddered. He was within a few feet of the girl. He could see the throb of her breast under its thin covering and smell the fragrance of the tossing hair. He could see the narrow bed with its pieced calico cover, the whitewashed walls with gay lithographs, and every crevice stuck full of twigs with dangling cocoons. There were pegs for the few clothes, the old chest, the little table, the two chairs, the uneven floor covered with rag rugs and braided corn husk. But nothing was worth a glance except the perfect face and form within reach by one spring through the rotten mosquito bar. He gripped the limb above that on which he stood, licked his lips, and breathed through his throat to be sure he was making no sound. Elnora closed the book and laid it aside. She picked up a towel, and turning the gathered ends of her hair rubbed them across it, and dropping the towel on her lap, tossed the hair again. Then she sat in deep thought. By and by words began to come softly. Near as he was the man could not hear at first. He bent closer and listened intently. Ever could be so happy, murmured the soft voice. The dress is so pretty, such shoes, the coat, and everything. I won't have to be ashamed again, not ever again, for the Limberlost is full of precious moths, and I always can collect them. The bird woman will buy more tomorrow, and the next day, and the next. When they are all gone, I can spend every minute gathering cocoons, and hunting other things I can sell. Oh, thank God, for my precious, precious money. Why, I didn't pray in vain after all. I thought when I asked the Lord to hide me, there in that big hall, that he wasn't doing it, because I wasn't covered from sight that instant. But I'm hidden now, I feel that. Elnora lifted her eyes to the beams above her. I don't know much about praying properly, she muttered, but I do. Thank you, Lord, for hiding me in your own time and way. Her face was so bright that it shone with a white radiance. Two big tears welled from her eyes, and rolled down her smiling cheeks. Oh, I do feel that you have hidden me, she breathed. Then she blew out the lights, and the little wooden bed creaked under her weight. Pete Corson dropped from the limb and found his way to the road. He stood still a long time, then started back to the Limberlost. A tiny point of light flashed in the region of the case. He stopped with an oath. Another hound trying to steal from a girl, he exclaimed. But it's likely he thinks if he gets anything it will be from a woman who can afford it, as I did. He went on, but beside the fences, and very cautiously. Swamp seems to be alive tonight, he muttered. That's three of us out. He entered a deep place at the northwest corner, sat on the ground and taking a pencil from his pocket, he tore a leaf from a little notebook, and laboriously wrote a few lines by the light he carried. Then he went back to the region of the case and waited. Before his eyes swept the vision of the slender white creature with tossing hair. He smiled, and worshipped it, until a distant rooster faintly announced dawn. Then he unlocked the case again, and replaced the money, laid the note upon it, and went back to concealment, where he remained until Elnora came down the trail in the morning, appearing very lovely in her new dress and hat. 